Well, amen. Thank you, Sister Sandra, for blessing us this morning. I love that song, one of my favorites of all time, and just um, thank you for singing that and blessing us this morning. Um, be turning to Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43 is where we're going to start at today, and um, I hope you got an ink pen. I'm going to be going through a lot of verses today, and so um, you may miss something or... Um, get home later and say, what was that verse or that he brought out? And so I'd encourage you to jot down um, the references and go back and look at them. But um, we're going to um, continue this morning. We took a break last week with Mother's Day, and we're going to continue this morning on great themes of the Bible and look at what the Bible says about the temple. And as is the case so often, um, things that we see in the Old Testament become pictures and types of things that we see in full in the New Testament. And that's true with the temple. And I want to um, talk to you this morning about the temple from this standpoint as it being the place where God's glory dwells. The place where God's glory dwells. Ezekiel 43, Ezekiel sees a vision of a future temple and in chapter 43, he sees the glory of God filling this temple. It says in verse 1, Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the visions, the vision which I saw by the river Kabar, and I fell on my face. Notice verse 4. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, they nor their kings by their harlotry or with the carcasses of their kings on their high places. When they set their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost, with a wall between them and me, they defiled my holy name by the abominations which they committed. Therefore I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put their harlotry and the carcasses of their kings far away from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that your glory still fills your temple. Lord, may your glory fill our hearts, fill our lives to overflowing today. May we put away anything that defiles so that we might be fully consecrated to you, that your spirit might completely fill us to overflowing this morning. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Ezekiel's, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 describe in elaborate detail a temple that was future in Ezekiel's day. Bible scholars have disagreed over its fulfillment as well as its interpretation. There are certainly aspects of it as described in these chapters that have not been seen or fulfilled in any temple yet to date. This leads many to see it in symbolic terms as fulfilled in the church, while others see it in a more literal sense as a literal temple to be built during Christ's millennial kingdom. As is the case so often, though, with Jewish prophetic writings, there are often multiple levels of fulfillment and multiple levels of interpretation and application so I don't believe it does harm to the scripture if you want to take it literal, literal as well as a symbolic application to us, the church. So for our sake this morning, because we are in the church age, when Christ is dealing in the world through the Gentile church, I want us to see the symbolic 
application of the temple as being the place where God's glory dwelt. The place where God's glory dwelt. The application is this. Just as God's glory filled the temple in the Old Testament, His glory will fill us who are called the temple of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. In the age in which we live, God desires to fill us to overflowing with His glory and with His presence. Now, I want us to start by seeing God's glory and the temple, and we start by seeing the history of the temple. I'm not going to have you go back and look up all the passages dealing with the building of the temple and with how the temple came about, but I just want to give you a brief history this morning of how the temple came about. We saw a couple weeks ago how David, when he rediscovered the ark of God, he brought it to Jerusalem and he put it in a tent or a tabernacle known as David's tabernacle. That was in 2 Samuel chapter 6. When you get to the next chapter in 2 Samuel, we find David having a crisis in his heart. He gets to looking at the, tent, at the tent that he had put up and the ark of God and the presence of God being in that tent and he begins to feel guilty because he is in an elaborate and ornate palace whereas God is having to dwell in a tent. And so as he gets to feeling guilty of this, he asks the Lord, if I can make you a house where you can dwell, can I make you a temple? And God told him that he didn't want or need a house, but he made the following promise to David. In that 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13, God makes this promise to David. He said, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Notice this next Phrase and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, who is the Lord talking about? Who is he showing David would come? Was he talking about David's son Solomon, who will who will um, succeed him to the throne, or was so and was Solomon's throne even established forever? If you study the Old Testament, you know that Solomon's throne becomes divided because Solomon becomes an apostate for a while where he serves the gods of the many wives that he had taken from among the pagans. His kingdom is divided, so his throne was not necessarily established forever. Could he be talking about a different ruler or a different type or house that God wanted to establish? Even Solomon, when he builds the temple, realized that the temple that he built could not contain the presence and glory of God. How many of you know that there's not a house big enough on earth to contain the presence and glory of God? There's not a single person who is spiritual enough to contain all of the fullness and presence of Almighty God. There is not a house, there's not a church, there's not a temple. There is nothing that we could build on earth that can contain the glory of God. And Solomon realized this. When Solomon is praying about to dedicate the temple, he, pray, he says this in 2 Chronicles 6 verse 18. But will God in very deed dwell with men on earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. He says we are building this house. It's going to be similar to the tabernacle, but a more permanent and more ornate and embellished structure where God, we're asking God's presence to come down, but I realize that even in building it, it's not going to be big enough to, to contain the presence of Almighty God. God is that big. God is that awesome. God is that omnipotent that you and I cannot, in our flesh, do anything or build anything anything that can contain him. We can't even describe him in human language because God is that powerful. And so Solomon realizes this. But we do find God's glory, the glory of God filling the temple that Solomon built. 
In 2 Chronicles 7, Solomon prayed for God to have mercy and forgive his people in 2 Chronicles 6. Then in, he also prayed for God to fulfill the promises that he had made to David and Israel. And we find in 2 Chronicles 7 that God answered by fire. No wonder Elijah... When you fast forward many years, no wonder Elijah, when he's challenging the prophets of Baal, he said, let the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And God answers by fire. Our God is a consuming fire, we're told in Scripture. In 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3, it says, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. And consume the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house, and the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord. I could stop right there and just preach all morning on that one thing. Imagine if God's glory so filled the house that the preachers couldn't preach and the singers couldn't sing. Imagine if God's glory was so manifest and so powerful in a place that we could not even enter into it. That's what happened when Solomon dedicates this temple. God's glory comes down in the form of fire and consumes the, the sacrifice on the altar. And it so fills the temple that the priests themselves can't even go in and make sacrifices. They have to make provision where they have to make sacrifices outside because they couldn't even get in because of the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. The priest could not enter into the house because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground. By the way, that's the only appropriate response when we come into the presence of God. Get us out of the way. Falling on our faces before him because he is holy and we're not. He is powerful and we're not. He is God and we're not. And when we come into his presence, our natural response ought to be what theirs was and fall on our faces before him in his presence. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Aren't you glad his mercy endures forever? Even though Solomon says, I know this house can't contain all of him, would you come down? And God came down and met with them, and they fall on their faces, and they say, Lord, you are a good God. You are a merciful God. Even in our sinfulness, even in our times of straying, you have still been with us. You have still shown your mighty strong hand towards us. You are merciful. You are good. And so we just want to praise you a while for that. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, we serve a good God whose mercy is, endures forever, whose mercy is new every morning, and great is His faithfulness. So may we praise Him this morning. May we bow before Him. May we get rid of anything that's displeasing to Him so that His glory might fill the house. Hallelujah. The glory of God filled Solomon's temple. But then we find in Ezekiel 10 that the glory of God left Solomon's temple. The people of Judah had backslidden to the point. They're worshiping and serving the false gods of the people around them instead of the true and living God. And so God turns them over to their enemies, the Chaldeans, to destroy them. And Ezekiel saw in a vision the glory of God rising up from the temple and leaving. And we never find it coming back in this same way. The glory of God left. The people sinned and didn't repent. And it left and did not come again for over 580 years, almost 600 years. The glory left and didn't come back. The people built a new temple under Ezra and Zerubbabel. Herod would refurbish that temple, the second temple, but the glory did not come back until the king of glory came in. Hallelujah. Some of y'all are going to get that and you're going to have a glory spell on the way home. 
the king of glory, the psalmist, put it this way, Psalm 24, 7 through 8. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Who's the king of glory? It's Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. He would grace that temple when the king of glory comes. And he comes into the temple and because the king of glory had shown up and he showed up in a way that they weren't expecting and that was contrary to their tradition instead of welcoming the glory of God back through the person of Jesus instead they rebel and they reject him and their nation gets cut off. As a result, the king of glory came to the temple. He cleansed it in Matthew 21, 12 through 17. He prophesied its destruction in Matthew 24, 2. He said, not one stone is going to be left upon another. And in AD 70, Titus the Roman came in and the destruction was so great that not one stone was left upon another, according to historians. Jesus also proclaimed, though, that there's a new temple. He proclaimed himself as the temple. In John 2, 19, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. Jesus would be destroyed on the cross. That when Passover was fulfilled and Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, went to the brazen altar of the cross, shed his blood to pay for the sins of, for the sins of mankind once and for all and opened up the veil of the temple so now all can come near the presence of God because the king of glory had gone to a cross and he died in our place and he rose from the dead and now all who call upon his name will be saved. Jesus Christ, the king of glory, Glory proclaimed, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm going to raise it up again. Now we can take this literally, his bodily resurrection. The temple of his body destroyed, raised from the dead. We can also take it symbolically because now we, the church, are the body of Christ on earth. And what did Paul write about us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19? He said, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. We are not our own. We're bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. And now we have become the temple of God on earth. Not in temples made with hands, but in the temple of our hearts. God Almighty comes to dwell within us. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we're immersed by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. The Spirit comes to dwell in us as we are given the deposit, the down payment, the earnest money of our inheritance. And now you and I are the temple of God. And let me just say that Jesus Christ still wants to fill the temple with his glory. Hallelujah. Just as in the Old Testament when the glory of God came down in response to the prayers of the people and he answered by fire, God would do the same thing again in the temple of the church. He answered in response to their prayers. In Acts 1.14 it says they were daily in prayer. We find that he answered in response to his promise. In Acts 1, 4, and 5, it says, And being assembled together with them, this is just before Jesus' ascension, he commanded them that they should not depart Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence or not many days from now. And it was ten days later when Pentecost came that the Spirit fell like cloven tongues of fire, rested on them and filled every one of them in the house. But he answered in response to their prayers. He answered in response to his promises And then just as he had done, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he changes not. What he did in the past, he can do today. 
How he's worked in the past, he can still work today. How his glory filled the temple in the past, his glory can fill the temple of your heart today. How did he answer in Solomon's day? He answered by fire. How does he answer in the apostles' day? He answers by fire. How does he answer in our hearts? He sets our hearts ablaze where we're like the two on the road to Emmaus that said, did our hearts not burn within us when he talked with us in the way? Hallelujah. He still is the God who answers by fire. Now, John the Baptist had prophesied this. He said, John the Baptist said in Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. John prophesied it, and Jesus did it. Acts 2, 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. God answered by fire, and His glory filled the temple. And God still wants to answer by fire and fill the temple. What happened when they filled when the temple of God, the, the church, was filled with the Holy Spirit? They were filled with unspeakable joy and unbridled praise. They're, they were able to sing and proclaim the praises of God in a new way that they had never been able to do before. They were given supernatural ability and strength by the Holy Spirit of God working in them, filling them to overflowing, just as Jesus had told them, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. What do they do once the Holy Ghost comes upon them, once he fills the temple, once God answers by fire the gospel then is being preached in power all over the world and has been for the last 2,000 plus years as God continues to fill his temple the fame of what God was doing starts getting out in public because they didn't understand what was happening and didn't know the promises of God they said they must be drunk with wine and Peter said, they are not drunk with wine as you suppose, but this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That promise is to you, is to you, is to you the Israelites, Peter would say, and it's also to those who are afar off. And praise God, those of us who were afar off, we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus, grafted into the tree of God's work as the wild olive branches become branches of the vine Jesus Christ bearing his fruit to the world and now the Holy Spirit of God and his fullness is available to you and I who believe hallelujah Jesus did it and Jesus will continually do it until he comes again how do you where do you get that Ephesians 5 18 be not drunk with wine wearing his excess but be filled with with the Spirit. That word filled is a continuous action verb. It means to keep on being filled. We don't just get filled once and for all. We need a fullness every day that we live. We need the Spirit of God to be poured out in our, in our lives. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts in new ways, in fresh ways. Each and every day that we live, as we go through this world, sometimes... We leak, and we need to be filled again with the Spirit of God. We need Jesus Christ to continually fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can live the life He called us to live. We can do what He's called us to do. We can fulfill the Great Commission. We can preach the gospel of the kingdom in all the world until the end comes. Hallelujah. We need the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit, and we need Him every day. Well, I thought you got the Holy Spirit when you get saved. You do. 
But there's one thing to have the down payment and another thing to be filled to overflowing. And we need to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit so we can do whatever it is that God has called us to do. You say, I can't do it. You're a good candidate for it. You can't. But God can. So let Him. He will continually fill the temple with His glory. How will He do it? The same way He's always done it. As we pray. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? As we hunger and thirst after righteousness, Jesus said, Blessed are those which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. As we repent of our sins, just as they did in Solomon's day, they said, we want to put away all the things the word or in Ezekiel it says put, they put away the harlotry. In other words, they had been committing spiritual adultery by worshiping other things. And whenever you and I put anyone or anything above God, we're guilty of the same thing. And when we put that aside, he says the glory of God will come in and fill the temple. And when we put away anything that is hindering our walk with God, when we put away anything in our lives that's displeasing to God, any attitudes we have, any actions we have, whenever we strive to live a holy life before Him and we ask Him again for a fresh outpouring of the Spirit, He has promised that He will supply. Hallelujah. When we repent of sin, as we pray... Turn from our sins. He will pour His Spirit out. He will answer by fire. He will fill us to overflowing. Hallelujah. What a good God. And He'll do this until He comes again. Until the day that His glory fills the whole earth. The psalmist put it this way, Psalm 72, 19. Blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Let it be. Praise the Lord. There's coming a day when the glory of the Lord is going to fill the whole earth. Daniel saw it as a mountain. In Daniel 2, 35. It says, the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. One day the kingdom of God is going to come in full. It's going to come in power. Now it's invisible in our hearts. Then it's going to be visible for all to see. The king of glory will return to this earth and his glory is going to fill the whole earth. The mountain of his kingdom is going to take down all the kingdoms of this world and he will rule in righteousness and reign forever and forever and you and I will rule in reign with him hallelujah even so come quickly lord jesus may we may, lord haste the day the hymn writer said when our faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump sh the trumpet shall sound and the lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul hallelujah it is well with my soul is it well with your soul Lord, fill us afresh and anew to overflowing with the Holy Spirit to get done what needs to get done until Jesus comes. Because I don't know about you, but I got some people that I want to take with me. I got some people that aren't in my family that aren't ready to meet Him. I got some people in my family that are far from God. I've got friends and co workers and, and family members and acquaintances and neighbors who don't know Jesus, who are far from God and they need to know Him. And I need the fullness of the Holy Spirit so I can have the right word at the right time in the right way so they'll turn to faith in Jesus. May He fill us afresh and anew. Lord, show us your glory. Even, I got to think about it. Yesterday I was talking to my dad on the phone. He's still my greatest encourager. He's still my hero and my mentor. 
And I was talking to him on the phone yesterday about these passages that God was bringing to my mind and, I, and to my, laying on my heart for this morning. I said, Dad, I just want to see the glory of God. Even if it's just the hinder parts, like Moses saw when he's hid in the cleft of the rock. He, he asked God, show me your glory. And God said, if you see it, you'll die if you're, you see my face. So he said, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, and when I pass by, you can see the hinder parts. Lord, if it's only the hinder parts, let me see a glimpse of your glory. Just a glimpse of all that you are and all that you can be and all that you can do in and through my life. Lord, show us your glory, even if it's just a glimpse. Fill us and use us as your temple on earth until you return and your glory fills the whole earth. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord.